Good morning. In these days of international tension and talk of war and trouble on the Afghanistan frontier and Iran, we can all sleep safely at night knowing that Canada stands willing, able and prepared to do whatever is necessary for the cause of the free world's security and defenses. What a piece of garbage that is. I think I've found a good Canadian election issue for this disastrous, farcical election that's going on in our country right now. And that is the apparent destruction, if not disappearance altogether, of the Canadian Armed Forces, the army bit of it. And here's the man who's going to tell us about it this morning. You've met him before, Gerald Porter, sometime permanent uh, member of the force, sometime reserve fellow, kind of shuffled out in a little bit of funny uh, state of affairs because he dared to criticize the Canadian defense establishment and its political leaders in his book called In Retreat. That's one short, sharp item we're going to throw at you this morning. And then still in terms of violence, but a different kind of violence, we're going to be dealing in some detail with a sensitive look at the problem of family violence, the task force on family violence. And here's a sample of the kind of problem that faces families. I was really badly bruised from, as I said, the waist, well, about the hip level to the knee. I was just black, absolutely black. You'll hear more of that shortly. Also on this morning's program, we're going to have a quick look at, um, what's its name? Anglesey Lodge. That farce, another farce operated by Vancouver City Council who apparently still want to knock down the perfectly good old building which has got lots of empty suites in a time when people are screaming for rental accommodation over the whole of the lower mainland. But first, Gerald Porter and the state of the Canadian, quote, army, unquote, after the break. We have a defence minister in Canada, his name is Alan McKinnon, and he said yesterday in Vancouver that while the Afghanistan situation is very serious, it's not critical, and he doesn't uh, give consideration to placing Canada's armed forces on any kind of alert. Have we got any armed forces that could be placed on an alert? No. In all of Western Canada, <clears throat> we have about 2,000 infantry soldiers left. The majority of them were all shipped east or retired in the last four or five years. In Canada, we have an army of about 17,000, of which about six or 7,000 of those are combat. You're telling me 17,000 army? That's right. We could put the whole of Canada's army in one side of Empire Stadium. That's right. I think you said. That's right, in the uh, article in the Vancouver Star. Of the 17,000, yeah. 6,000 are actual 6, combat 000, soldiers. 7,000 are infantry, yeah. How many soldiers did we have at the time of the October so-called revolution? Uh, Ten years ago, we had about 37, 38,000, which had been cut down from around 45,000 two years before. 45, 37, now 17. Now 17, and going down every day. Well, now, who's been keeping this a secret? I don't think anybody's been keeping it a secret. It's been going on very slowly since Trudeau came to power. Um, the army's been cut down by two or 4,000 people annually ever since he did come Why? to power. He wanted to save money. Well, all the other federal department budgets were indexed and going up. The armed forces budget was always held around the same point as a result. The Army had to find ways to keep within its budget, so they kept cutting staff and cutting staff. They didn't buy tanks, airplanes, or other things. So the Army kept getting smaller. You mean as they kept taking the, rightly enough, the 8% or the 9% raise every year, the only way they could get enough money to pay themselves was to chop off people That's at right. the bottom? That's right. That's so right. So we have a case where, where we have about 117, 120 generals, and an Army of, uh, when we get to the sharp end, the infantry, of about six thousand men. How many generals? About 117, 18. Now you got, you got hold of a report by Lieutenant General J.J. Paradis. Paradis? That's right. Paradis. What's his title? He is the commander of mobile command or the army. That's the new term for it. The mobile command, that it's is actually, the army. They call it with inside the army immobile command because it can't go anywhere. Hasn't got any vehicles, hasn't got any tanks, hasn't got any armor. It's got some armored cars, but that's all. Before we get to Paradis's report, tell me first of all the disposition. You said 17,000 right. in Canada. In Canada, um, about 2,600 in, uh, in West Germany, and a couple of thousand scattered in the Middle East 
on peacekeeping. They're not fighting troops. Only maybe 10% of them are. They're store and supply people. They're store of people. Various kind. Admin, yeah. Now, in your book, In Retreat, you also dealt with the destruction of our contribution to NATO. Well, when the former prime minister came to power in 1968, uh, we had around 15,000 people stationed in, uh, in West Germany. Today we have an army of about 2,500 or 600 over there, a very small Air Force contingent, and they are without their best arms because Trudeau t took away their nuclear arms. Well, I can't remember just the details of Trudeau taking away their nuclear arms. Nuclear tips for the warheads on the planes. That's right. We don't have them now. We don't. We could be supplied with them in any deadly emergency, could we? Well, the idea is that they'll send them to us from the States if we need them. But the broad picture is we've got 2,600 soldiers in, in Europe. In Europe. 2,000 in peacekeeping throughout the world. Right. And 17,000. In Canada. Now, describe the state and the morale from your point of view of these 17,000 soldiers, having read Paradis's report, which somebody apparently well, slipped to you. Well, as Parody said, the Army feels now that it, uh, it's totally um, demoralized to the point of almost being paralyzed to work. Uh, the command has busted down. The morale is considered to be the worst in 25 years. They're ill-equipped. They still don't have enough bullets to hold annual shoots to keep themselves in good shape. He also pointed out one joke that there are more tanks that the English and the Germans have more tanks in Canada than the Canadian Army. <laughs> you mean the Germans and the British are still That's training? Right. That's right. <coughs> Up in the prairies somewhere. That's right, and they have more tanks here than Canada has. Well, uh, w at least we've got the Germans and the British between Moose Jaw and Moscow. That's right. That's right. It helps, anyway. It sure does help. It I must say you. Now, the other thing which really shouldn't laugh at, because it's really quite pathetic, is it a nine-to-five army every which way? Yes, almost. As General Parody said, what had happened in the last seven or eight years as managers have been coming into the army instead of like officers and, and captains and lieutenants, leaders. The army is now operating on almost a uh, nine to five basis with weekends off. And there was one thing they did. <clears throat> they did a secret in-house study of army attitudes about seven months ago. It turned out that the support contingent of the army, 71% of them said they wouldn't follow the combat troops into a danger zone because they didn't think that was their job. you got to be joking. No, that was in the report. This was a study done for parody. That's right. On the attitude of men in the Canadian, in the Canadian Armed Canadian Forces, Army. in which every man <clears> is supposed to be able to at least pack a rifle and a kit bag and a pack and a, a handful of ammunition. That's right. And the support troops said they did not consider their function to follow the combat troops in, into action. Into a danger zone. What was done right. about it? Nothing. They can't seem to do anything about it, though, Jack. Maybe, maybe you and I are just making a fuss about nothing. Maybe Canada doesn't need an army. I mean, we're never Quite going possibly. to have any civil disorder in this country, are we? Well, somebody told me in Ottawa a few years ago, somebody who was a full colonel in the infantry, he said if there was a civil emergency of any kind in Canada and suddenly a second one occurred, they would be able to send enough soldiers to take care of one, but they couldn't take care of two. Should we say God bless the RCMP? Are they our real army in this country? To an extent, yes. They have become the army. More with Gerald Porter, author of In Retreat, and a man who spies on the condition and caliber of the Canadian army as often as he can. And you also teach at Langara. I do. Journalism. Mm -hmm. That's right. Reporting after the break. Gerald Porter, Army services expert in his own way. Is it worthwhile bothering chasing the politicians in on this? If I have McKinnon in here as Minister of Defense, I know he's got some idea about de-unification. I know he's on the cross of what fighter planes to buy that are already out of date. Is right. that not so? Sure, yes. How many years are we out of date buying buy planes now? Our aircraft are now, our, our basic fighter aircraft in Canada, some of them are 24 and 25 years old. They're totally out of date. They're we obsolete. can't afford to buy these, these newly obsolete American ones either, can well, we? Well, the thing is that the Tory government inherited the D-1 
delays of the Trudeau government, who was supposed to buy the airplanes around 1971-72. They didn't buy anything for the armed services. They put it off for so long that when the Conservatives come in, they're essentially shopping for a whole new Air Force and a whole new fleet. Now, you yourself were kind of kicked out of the reserves. I was a little Bear while ago. Bear your breast and tell us. Why oh. were you kicked out? Well, after a long time, they finally gave me my Canadian Forces medal. They gave it to me one evening at HMCS Discovery, where I was more or less shunned by my colleagues for having published the book. And the following day, I was asked, I was simply told I had been put on the, the inactive list, which meant, to an extent, I had been shoved off to one side. That's because you had written a book called In Retreat. Yeah, that's right. All right, now, supposing we decided to be tough and follow the Americans and patrol the 200-mile limit and prevent Soviet fishing inside our 200-mile limit. Is there anything we could do on the West Coast to well, stop no. them? Well, uh, no. I talked to somebody in Victoria about this just a little while ago. We have on the West Coast, what people out here perhaps don't understand is, because we didn't build any ships for so long, that all the good ships were shipped to the East Coast four and five years ago. They have all the good ships, what we have, or what we can call good ships. We have a handful, maybe three or four, old steam-powered ships that could sail out of the West Coast they're about 20 years old, 21 years old. They're totally useless. They're falling apart, and they would have to go out about half manned. I had one person in the Navy over there tell me he doubted very, very much that if we put our ships out, they could even get out to the 200-mile edge off Canada before something happened. I thought we had about seven <laughs> vessels in the Squimalt. We do, but, uh, but about four of them are tied up. And the, the insides of them have been taken out and cannibalized to keep the other ones going for years. And they've got to get bilingual crews too, haven't they? Well, that's happening here too. Certain jobs are being held for people from Quebec in the armed forces or who have a bilingual classification and you cannot fill that spot with a qualified English-speaking person if they can find anybody from Quebec to take that job. Uh, do you think McKinnon, if he gets the right report, could possibly de-unify the forces? That's what the uh, that's what the Tories intend. There's been in-house studies. Would it be bad or good? Oh, it would be excellent. And it wouldn't cost anything. Back to their old uniforms? Sure. All they'd have to do would be dye the ones they got now. It would be very good for morale. Well, Gerald Porter, you've cheered me up immensely. I have an election issue. And I'll ask McKinnon and all the others, why not scrap the armed forces altogether and give the Mounties two extra machine guns? <laughs> that would be about the same thing, wouldn't it? I think almost about the same. But you're kidding me not. In Canada today, we have 17,000 military members of Mobile Command That's who right. would fill half of the old, Empire. outdated Empire Stadium. That's all we have. Keep up the good fight. Okay. Gerald Porter. Next, a very sensitive study done by Brian, followed by a panel on the battered wives syndrome. from, as I said, the waist, well, about the hip level to the knee. It, I was just black, absolutely black. It's called the battered wife syndrome. Not a new phenomena, but a frightening one. In fact, family violence of this type occurs in as many as one in three live-in relationships. Horrifying experiences like the ones these women have been put through. Um, he didn't harm me above the waist. The injuries occurred between my waist and my knees, but he re it was really very bad. It, I had a lot of bruises. He tore all my clothes off. Everything I had on, every single item of clothing I had on was ripped, ruined. I put them all in the garbage can. The only thing that was still intact were my shoes. Well, the first time was just a matter of, you know, slapping and stuff like that, but the second one was, wasn't too good. It was a bit more violent, kicking and punching and stuff like that. An actual fist fight? Yeah. Were you beaten to the point that you couldn't go out of the house uh, for... In my first marriage, yeah. Black eyes, cut lips? Mm-hmm. An actual fist fight, then? Right. Dodging constantly. But the beaten women are coming forward. 
Small numbers of them getting out of the hell they've lived in in many cases for years. And part of the reason is the high profile taken by some agencies like the United Way in this commercial, part of a national campaign. Citizen and health, they lived happily ever after. Until the beatings began. So many beatings you can't even count the times. They're a lot more like her, living in fear. Afraid to leave, afraid to stay. They need help in turning their lives around. Help with their kids while they do. Thanks to you, there is help. The United Way. 18-year-old Laura is one of the beaten women. She became pregnant. She and her common-law husband had little money. She never dreamed he'd beat her. Yeah, the difference was so unreal, you know. It's, it's like a big charade, you know. Uh, I'll do this for you. He used to do everything for me. He, he, he was almost too perfect. And then as soon as we moved in together, he kind of had me cornered. I had no money. You know, I couldn't go back to my mom with the baby. So my mom couldn't help. Nobody could help me because I was stuck where I was financially, which was the biggest problem. He used to blame me, you know, I have to pay all the bills because you got pregnant. You know, you could have done something about it. Tell me how, uh, how one of these fights would develop uh, when you were battered. Oh, he would, he would just start drinking, and then he'd ask, then uh, I'd ask him maybe to uh, make up a bottle for the baby, and he'd say, no, that's a mother's job. And I said, well, you're the father, too, and you're always complaining about, you know, you can never do enough for her, so just do this for me and her. And then he'd start on, I pay the bills, that should be enough. And I run this house, and I make it a home, because without me, you'd be nowhere, you'd have nothing. Would he chase you around the house and kick and hit you? He, if I was, yeah, if I wouldn't let him, like, he got mad at me one day and then he wanted to hold the baby because she was crying because we were both fighting. She was upset and he went to her and I went to pick her up because I didn't know what he was going to do and then he'd just start hitting me while I grabbed the baby, you know, so that I wouldn't take her. So he actually hit you when you had the baby? Yeah. Ellie represents the great masses of middle-income women. Married twice, both her men beat her. It went on for years. The so arguments would start if we were had, if there hadn't been any drinking, and would never they would just end. They wouldn't uh, sol be solved or anything until there was a drink, and it would come up again, and it would be worse. So the liquor brought out sort of the chip on the shoulder right. and, and the violent action. Right. Um, were they severe fights? In my first marriage, yeah. What effect did, uh, do you think that had on your children? How old's your oldest? Six. What on effect? Christmas Eve. Quite a bit. She talks about how she heard me screaming the night we left. And my younger one, well, he talks about the first fight and how he saw it all. So they're at a perceptive age that, uh, as you were when you were young. Right, right that they're going to probably remember it. Right, they're quite, kind of confused about the whole thing. What made you sort of come to the realization that you had to escape? Because thinking so many times that I could do something about it and realizing that as my life was going on, I wasn't solving anything at all. I figured we weren't getting help, so I better get help. And before. you weren't going to change these people. That's right. That it couldn't be changed by me because I've tried and, and I don't maybe know how to cope with that. So I have to find out how to stop it before my children get into it. Do you accept some of the responsibility yourself? I must because it's got to be both sides, I guess, from maybe from my childhood. Pat was married for seven years to a man who is now a prominent doctor. It took her a long time to get over her fear of men but she still remembers the hell her former husband put her through. Well, we were on the honeymoon when the first evidence of violent behavior came up. Um, it wasn't that violent at that time, just in the form of slaps. A slap when he was angry with me. Did the batterings uh, happen with some sort of regularity <laughs> over the years? Um, during the period, well, it escalated. During the period of the marriage overall, I would say it averaged about once every three and a half, four months. Alcohol involved on these occasions? Oh yes, very much so. 
This is the catalyst in the in the whole fist fight of Harry. It certainly was in the majority of instances affecting me. Yes, very much. Do you remember uh, a specifically violent occasion? Yes, I remember one very violent occasion. It was at Christmas time. I don't think he knew what he was doing. He was really violent. It was the worst worst incident in the whole marriage was this particular incident. Um, he didn't harm me above the waist. He, the injuries occurred between my waist and my knees, but he re it was really very bad. It, I had a lot of bruises. He tore all my clothes off. Everything I had on, every single item of clothing I had on was ripped, ruined. I put them all in the garbage can. The only thing that was still intact were my shoes. Similarities exist in most wife-beating situations. The booze, the arguments over money, the past family experiences which make many women surprisingly think that a wife-beater is a normal husband. Yeah, my dad used to do it quite a lot to my mom because he was drinking and stuff like that. A lot of arguments? Yeah. And violent fights? Yeah, t yeah especially towards the end. Over a number of years? Uh, yeah, I think from right from the start, you know, it was just the same situation, just got together because of the kids. Do you relate that experience, uh, you're growing up, to what's happened to you as being sort of a, a normal thing in a relationship? Yeah, well, I've seen it a couple times, and I just thought, you know, that's what everybody does. You know, like, everybody hits their wives and... That's just part of the marriage. It happened at home and... Yeah. And did it happen um, to any of your relatives as well? Or? Yeah, I went to stay with my aunt one time and my uncle beat on her too, so I just, you know, I didn't think my mom and dad were any special then. First I thought they did. You know, it was special, you know. He shouldn't do that. But then I saw my uncle and aunt and then I figured that was normal. So it was an all-too-common thing in your background and you related it as being normal in your relationship, at least at first. Yeah. I mean, you know, like for my mom, it was too late. But for anybody who wants to do something, just sit down and look at the things, weigh the pros and cons, and then if it says get out, get out as fast as you can and don't, you know, kind of hold on to what you had. When you say it was too late for your mom, what do you mean? Well, she had gotten into a pattern so much that she couldn't care. She gave up on herself, you know. She thought, oh, that's it, that's my life, you know, that's what I've been bought in this world to do, is to be beaten up sort of thing and put down and everything. Oh, nothing like that in my family at all. I, it was, I, that's one of the things I couldn't believe it was happening to me. I had nothing like that in my family. How about your husband? Uh, my husband's family, um, he told me, he didn't talk about it much, but he told me that his father was an alcoholic on one occasion. I did meet his parents, but they lived in another country, so I don't can't verify that from my own knowledge. Do you suspect that? Uh, I suspect they pro he probably did beat his wife. And do you think that this perhaps had an effect on your husband? I think my husband learned that he didn't have to worry about women. They were, you know, you could do what you wanted to women. That they were there to be subservient to the man. That I think that's a pattern he learned in his family. Let's go back to your childhood. Uh, any. Uh, Beatings, father beating your mother? Yes. Frequently? Quite often and very heavy arguments. Violently? I can remember a few times, yes. And what did you do as children? Well, we hid under the couch or we'd hide in our rooms or anything to get away from it. Did you ever think for a minute uh, as you were growing up that you'd be caught in that same element? No, I always had it planned I would never live like that. Did you know when it was happening to you that no. it was really happening? No, I always thought it could be cured. Whatever was starting would stop. That you could change your husband? Right. Or I should say husbands? Right. Um, before you got married mm -hmm. to both men, uh, did you see anything in them that would uh, bring on this kind of uh, violent reaction? No, they completely acted altogether differently before we were married. And what was the change? It went from uh, affectionate and um, thoughtful to not caring and, and rough. And there are similarities in almost all wife-beating situations if the police are called in. 
It's usually the standard reply from the husband and wife who just moments ago were fighting with their fists. Uh, they want to see the police, but they can also relate that uh, tomorrow is another day. Um, if they lay a charge against their husband or the husband lays a charge against the wife, um, the next day, uh, it's the family that ends up paying, and they pay almost as much as the, as the accused person. So there's a reluctance, I guess, on their part to, to take it all the way. Oh, yes, definitely, I would say a reluctance. And perhaps a reluctance on their part to admit that uh, they're the ones in the wrong and blame it on somebody else. Uh, there, is, there are some cases like this. Uh, the majority of them, though, uh, one blames the other. First thing we tell our members to do is to separate the two, the husband and the wife, and to uh, try and calm the situation down as much as they can and uh, to advise both parties what their rights are uh, in this type of situation. Now, in relation to this, we have uh, members of the uh, Human Resources working in our police stations, both downtown at 312 Main Street and at Oak Ridge uh, at 41st and Canby. One of the things police tell the women they encounter after being called to a family dispute is that they have an outlet, somebody they can call for help and advice, the crisis line, where they can discuss their humiliating problem with anonymity. And we wouldn't give them advice, we would give them some alternatives that they could do. We would want to identify the situation immediately as to the emergency of the situation, whether the husband is right there, do they have some time to go, uh, for, and then give them some alternatives and that they could, they could seek out. What kind of alternatives? Uh, counseling for themselves, counseling for the, the, the two, the husband and the wife. Uh, protection from <clears throat> the husband uh, through the, the court system if there needs to be. Uh, legal proceedings, a separation, or legal separation, divorce, uh, leaving and getting protection at a, a transition house to protect them for the next few weeks or so. Where do women like Laura, Ellie, and Pat turn to when the beatings continue? Their friends won't understand. They can't talk to them. That's where the transition house enters the picture, the secret stopping off spot for the woman who wants out. Transition workers like Kathy Starr operate the small numbers of homes for women who want a place out of reach from their husbands. Um, very quickly, Good relationships develop between women staying in the house. They're very supportive of one another. And she very immediately sees that she's not alone, that there are other women in the same situation. And it's a very warm, comfortable, safe place to be. All of the women, we have, I was talking to a woman today, a past resident, who was telling me, hooray, hooray for you. If you guys hadn't been there, I don't know what I would have done. And she was one of those women that was terrified of the idea of coming to transition but felt she, well, I have to come. I have no place else to go. And after she got here, I said, wow, why didn't I come here before? How many would you turn away in a year? That's hard to say. say. If we saw 400 women last year, we probably turned away close to 400 because we just didn't have space. And when you're talking about turn away those 400, that's a very small percentage of what's out there. Very small. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Women from all walks of life come here because wife battering has no social barriers. Whether a woman is on welfare or whether she lives in British properties, she's getting beaten. It, it's broad spectrum. We've had doctor's wives. We had a woman in here last week uh, with two Rolls, Rolls Royces. She chose to go home because she wasn't prepared to change her lifestyle at this point. So it's, uh, alcohol is involved in large numbers of them. Um, money? Money, definitely. A woman living uh, upper middle class has no more money than a woman on welfare. That's her own money. And that's what often keeps a woman in a situation. Security. Yeah, security is there, even though she is repeatedly beaten. There's a certain amount of security in the familiarity. She has small children. Where does she go? She has no money in her pocket. You can't go to a motel unless you've got money. There's sometimes, for some people, a stigma attached to going to welfare for help. So you're a prisoner whether you live in the east end That's of Vancouver it. or British property. The other thing is that even if you go to welfare, you're a prisoner until you get out. Welfare can't help you. You have to be out of the situation before you can get any help from anybody. Kath, you've been at this for four years in transition house mm -hmm. uh, setting. Have you noticed a 
an increase in the number of um, mothers, wives being beaten? I don't think that there's a big increase in the numbers that are actually being beaten. I think there's an increase in the numbers of people who are talking about it. One of the things that we're seeing are more older women in the last few years. At first, it was just basically sort of 20 to maybe 35 in the age group. And we found that there's been a big jump, that we're having women 55, 60, 65. When you, into transition. when you say a woman that old, I mean, obviously, it's not a new thing. This has been going on for some time. Mm -hmm. I, I find it really hard to believe that somebody could stand, say, being beaten for five, six years and not get out of it. For some people, that's normal. Or they feel that it's normal. Their own background as children, they've been beaten. They've watched their parents beat on each other. So their this is, this is a, an aspect that uh, in the battered wife syndrome where they've watched parents do it and they Definitely. think it's a normal thing. Definitely. For them also, alcohol, even as children, has been involved. When we're talking about this pattern from, uh, from childhood, we're talking about the son watching dad beat mom, mm -hmm. daughter watching mom being beaten. Mm -hmm. And your ch parents are the prime role models for children, so that if you're beaten as a child and that's what to you is familiar, then chances are that are better than good that your children are going to follow the same pattern that you do. What's a, what would be a prime reason for arguments, fights, fist fights? Lack of communication? Lack of communication, money. Um, houses with the children? Lack of friends? Both husband and wife wanting to go out. No flexibility in a marriage. No flexibility. When we're talking numbers. Um, I've heard uh, one statistic, one in two, perhaps one in three, are battered wives. I think that's, that's a pretty fair assessment. These pictures in this transition house were taken just before Christmas. There were just a couple of battered women here then. Because Christmas is the time when the season catches up with the reality of the battered wife syndrome. And many call a truce for a time and forgive their husbands and go home. But it usually doesn't work out. We're very quiet at Christmas. We have women who will come in and stay up till about the 21st, 22nd, and then we sort of cool out over Christmas and January. Not the 1st of January because there's holidays, Christmas and then there's New Year's, but about the 15th of January, all hell breaks loose. The, the bills start coming in, you know, the realization that, that things have been overspent at Christmas. And it's just boom, we explode in January. We also explode uh, around license time and, and insurance time. What advice would you have for the thousands of other battered wives out there that don't know that, they're, that they are battered wives and, and how to get out of it? I would say to definitely, if they really need, want help, which I think they all will come to that realization eventually, <clears throat> and have children, to do something about it now, to phone uh, crisis centers or, you know, places of this sort and actually find help. If they can't get their husbands or say their fathers, whatever it is that's involved, to get help with them, that they could get help for themselves. And then maybe they can continue with their life instead of getting worse and feeling that it's never going to change. Wife battering to the surprise of many husbands is common assault, a criminal offense. And many disputes end up in family court. Judge Douglas Campbell has seen too many of those common assault cases in the five years he spent on the bench. It's a crime of violence, which I think uh, is of the most serious category. And uh, I don't think anyone in this system underestimates its significance. Do you think society in general underestimates its significance? There has been a lot of discussion about that. And uh, there's been the criticism that people perceive it to be a social problem and uh, therefore uh, not to be dealt with. And, uh, any of the usual ways that breaches of the peace are dealt with. Um, that might be seen to be dealing with it in a less serious way. And there has been some complaint that historically that's the way family violence cases have been dealt with. Most husbands charged with common assault, even to the end, can't accept the full blame of their actions. It's common to put blame elsewhere, but almost all of them are embarrassed to be in court. Husbands who beat their wives who come into your court uh, do you see them go away as sorry for their action? Is there any remorse? Quite often there's a lot of remorse. Quite often uh, 
there's very little I can do to make that person feel worse than he does the day he walks in the door. It's pretty humiliating, I Quite. Imagine. And it's an incident which often arises which a person is very sorry for thereafter. Often that doesn't do much good, however, because um, it has initiated a family breakup uh, on occasion. Uh, it puts that person in criminal jeopardy, which is this court's responsibility to enforce. And uh, often the simple fact of remorse uh, isn't uh, a factor of great weight, but it's very often present. And some of those wife-battering cases in family court shouldn't be judged in that court at all. Judge Campbell has seen cases where husbands came very close to murder. Uh, sometimes uh, what I wonder about is the um, manner in which the case has been dealt with from the outset. With uh, some of those cases, they would qualify, I think, for a much more serious look uh, than perhaps the charge that has indeed been laid. Um, I'm not sure uh, in those individual instances what kind of factors come into play at the time that uh, the lady chooses to lay the, lay the charge, but uh, when you see the aftermath, you wonder uh, whether indeed it is strictly a common assault matter uh, or an assault causing bodily harm. Could be a much more serious... Uh... Could very well be. And the police will tell you about those many incidents of family violence that they're called to. For many of the homicides they investigate each year, started with an argument and then a fist fight between a husband and his wife. Serious assaults and some homicides are the results of, uh, uh, of what started out to be a family fight. And uh, for example, it could end up going through the kitchen. And uh, as we all know, kitchens are full of weapons such as rolling pins and knives. And uh, the first thing you know, you have a real serious matter on your hands. The worst in sickness and in health. They lived happily ever after, until the beatings began. So many beatings, you can't even count the times. They're a lot more like her, living in fear, afraid to leave, afraid to stay. Really, I, I don't know. I don't know about any of this. I'm fine. Nothing happened. Okay. I don't suppose anybody has all the answers to this wife-beating syndrome. And I don't know whether it's any worse now than it ever was. I've been dealing with it on and off in limited ways with telephone calls for 20 years. So let's talk to Flora McLeod, who's the coordinator of the Task Force on Family Violence. She works for United Way. Now, is it any worse than it ever was? Do we know more? Can we do any more effectively to help people in these circumstances? Chances are, Jack, it's probably not worse than it ever was. Uh, our history, our anthropologists are uncovering evidence from this from way back, and even more currently, some of the phrases we use now, like rule of thumb, comes from that very situation. The rule was, and this was in colonial America, that a man shouldn't really beat his wife with a stick any larger than his thumb. And well, that was the rule of thumb. That was the rule of thumb. And so there's, uh, you know, built into our myths and into our fairy tales, there are references to this. We don't think it was uncommon, no. It's just now, however, that it's become um, uh, of more concern. During the 60s, it was the discovery of childbirth, uh, child abuse. And during the 70s, uh, emphasis on the problems of family violence in the home. But I take it, I mean, quite sincerely, that youngsters today going into marriage or any kind of relationship are better rounded, better educated, that certainly know more about the world than my generation knew, and surely know enough to escape from this kind of behavior. Well, one would hope so, but uh, we're discovering that it's still very common, and the, uh, the three women who were interviewed certainly give evidence of that. They are expected as women to be responsible for the marriage and the family. Uh, he is head of the household, and uh, our laws, uh, even yet, uh, established that he is the one who has power over the rest of the members of that. Does it happen in a two-paycheck family? Oh, yes. Just yes. as much as in a one-paycheck family? I'm not sure about just as much because our statistics aren't awfully complete, but transition house workers have described women who have come into transition house who are working. Generally, however, their paycheck is under his control completely, and that sort, that, um, that sort of 
Total yeah. control is one of the features of this sort of situation. Now I want a Delta Car 86, if you don't mind me referred to as a car. This is Constable <laughs> Anne Beeftink of the Vancouver City Police. What exactly is the function of Car 86? Uh, to attend family dispute calls all over the city of Vancouver, whether it's Vancouver South or North. It's what's the kind of situation you do attend and what's the kind of problem you have to deal with? We attend all sorts of family dispute calls, whether it's child abuse or parent abuse or wife beating or husband beating, which hasn't happened very often. We'll get there, though. We'll, we'll take me to a doorstep where you get a frantic telephone call and you go up there and here's the husband and the wife and her face is a mass of blood. Usually somebody's been drinking. Uh, usually somebody's <coughs> quite drunk. The kids may or may not be in the house. They're generally not in the living room area. They're generally off in the bedrooms hiding. Um, it may have been a child that called this in. It depends on who the complainant is, who we will talk to. The uh, police <coughs> generally is a two-man unit. We'll enter the home and speak to the husband and the wife separately in separate rooms. Can you get in easily enough most times? Usually, yes. Usually people are quite cooperative because they both want um, the side of the police officer. I don't know how to put that. That's uh, right. They would both like to be They want to get on your right. side, yes. They That's want to right. prove to you that it wasn't their fault. That's right. That's right. Okay, there she is, though, but her face is all smashed up and she doesn't need to go to hospital. What happens? At that moment, she wants to see him to go to jail for life, doesn't she? Sometimes. Sometimes she didn't call. Sometimes she's trying to protect her husband to, to the very end of it. Um, if we'll say, Madam, do you want to press charges? It looks like you've been beat up and you definitely have a good common assault charge here. She'll say, no, it's the first time it's ever happened, which it probably isn't. And I don't suppose it'll ever happen again. Just leave him alone. He's my husband. I can't do anything about it now. Or she'll say, yes, I do want to press charges. And in that <coughs> case, she's liable to decide the next morning that she doesn't want the charges to go. She'll this sign, has happened. She's got to go down and sign an information. Yes, yes, to the Justice of the Peace. Because it was, I mean, you didn't now, she witness the assault. she doesn't always withdraw the charge, but mm. in a great number of the cases, this happens. And I think... Because of the prospect of a reconciliation. Quite often the husband will come back to the family home if she's still in the family home and say it'll never happen again and the woman believes him. Tell me, how many times, I mean, out of your own memory, can you think of going back to places not once but two or three times? Car 86, half of our calls, and I'm not speaking in statistics, mm. I'm guessing that half of our calls are repeats. Let's go now to Jim McKenzie. Jim, <coughs> are there any new techniques for dealing with this kind of thing? For instance, if I'm a wife in trouble, can I be sure of total support if I can demonstrate I've been beaten, even though my husband's got lots of money, he won't give me a nickel? Can I get total support from you people if I just gather my kids and go? In Vancouver, there is resources um, for the battered wife to turn to. Unfortunately, those resources are severely limited. For instance, the Vancouver Transition House um, only has a certain capacity for X number of, of women and their children. Uh, there are a few other facilities in Vancouver to carry overload, but on the whole, I think last year, Transition House turned away uh, well over 800 women and children because there was no s physical uh, place to put them. Now, do you think these people who seek a Transition House are really genuinely in trouble? Indeed. It's and not it just a question of a spat with the old man, let's get the hell out. No, there might be one or two instances of that periodically, but the majority of the women, you know, have been severely uh, abused, either physically or emotionally or a combination of those factors. I'm going to continue with my guests and with your phone calls. I think we should take phone calls. Yes, of course we should. To the point, though, after the break. It's always the kind of working class, lower middle class, and booze involved, isn't it, Jim McKenzie? False. False. What's the truth? Truth is that certainly you get people from the lower socioeconomic groups battering, and certainly in a lot of those, a lot of cases you will find alcohol present. But you'll also get the upper middle class, uh, the architect, your lawyer, your doctor, who are non-alcoholics who aren't drinking at the time when it occurs. Well, in that case, it's got to be pretty bad before the the proud wife uh, in Point Grey O'Shaughnessy is going to call a cop. Indeed. As a matter of fact, most often they don't. Uh, the people with the money and the resources will often turn 
uh, to private therapists if they're going to seek any kind of help at all. But in many cases, they don't. It's a, a matter of face, of, of pride. Oh, that isn't the only answer, Flora. If somebody's battening somebody and does it more than once or twice and children are involved, regardless of the economic circumstances, get the hell out. It's probably when the children involve themselves directly that the woman who is in the sort of circumstance Jim describes takes her first real step. Up until that time, she's really not encouraged to point out that this rising young executive or hardworking man mm -hmm. is someone who does what he does at home. He's a nice fellow, he gets along well at work, he's got a job, why should she upset uh, what should be the normal situation But if he for beats her? the children, will the wife, generally speaking, go? Or will she put up with that too? Well, it varies. Uh, it, probably it's wise to leave the first time because we've learned that violence of that sort escalates, it gets worse. It gets but easier after you hit for the first time, it seems like. Once okay. you've struck out once, it's easier the next time and so on. Violence becomes a matter of course. It does, and it, as I say, it's when the children get to be teenagers perhaps and intercede in some way that she finally makes the move and decides that this can't go on. By then the damage may be done. They've grown up in a home where they've witnessed violence and whether or not they have been the target of that violence, they've been subject to abuse. You've come across that in the West End with young prostitutes. Yeah, I've noticed but when asking the kids about their backgrounds, uh, male and female juvenile prostitutes, they'll often say that they were beaten as kids. Now, it's difficult to say whether or not this is true, but it seems, it seems to be a consistent thing that most of these kids will say that they were beat now, either by father or by mother or by relative. How often does Cat 86 and its equivalent, though, get called up to some really posh place? Not very very often. rarely. As I was saying, most of our calls have something to do with alcohol mm -hmm. in some form. And they're not the posh places generally. The police aren't called to the to the. Didn't you try an experiment at one time where social workers went out with the police? That that's car eighty six. Oh, uh, a social, a social worker. worker and a police officer in a police car mm -hmm. answering police calls and crisis center calls if we were asked to attend. Does the presence of the social worker? I suppose that helps the policeman. Oh yeah, the counseling is generally done by the by the social worker in the car. The keeping the, of the peace in the home is is done by the police officer in the. Home. A most unenviable task, isn't it? Mm. Three o'clock in the morning, everybody half drunk, mm. tears all over the place, ah. broken furniture and blood. <laughs> yes. And kids crying. And kids crying kids and screaming. Crying, yeah, and blood. And blood. Let's take some phone calls. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning. I'd like to speak to the social worker on there. All right, now, uh, Jim, you, would you answer to that camera? Okay. And if you get calls, Anne, will you answer to that camera? Yes. Yes, yes ma'am. Go ahead, ma'am. Yes, two years ago, um, I was beaten severely on a Saturday night, and I had uh, took my baby and I fled from my home and uh, went to a friend's place in which I, I was stayed. I spent the weekend there. Monday morning, I went to Human Resources and explained to them what had happened. I had black eyes and my nose was all puffed out. And, and explained to them what had happened. And they said that they couldn't do anything, that they would have to get in touch with my husband. I gave them the telephone number of the house in which, <coughs> uh, the home phone number, the address, and the place in which he was working. They said they would get back to me. Two days later, I got a phone call from them saying that your husband loves you, you've got a home, uh, he's willing to provide for you, and we can't do anything for you because we can only help you. Did you go back? I went back, I stayed for another month, and then I left. Why? Because I couldn't take it anymore. My, still... my kid and I were getting beaten up, and I couldn't stand oh, it, but yes. I didn't get on human resources. I had to go and live with another man and get an education and then get out of, on my own. <coughs> Why didn't you call the police? Why didn't you call the police? Uh, when when you are beaten up, first of all, when you get beaten up, you're just frantic. You don't know what to do. Your your mind is just not. You're not all together. The only thing you can think about is is the police takes time. All right, it takes too much time for the police to get there, and it's happened several times before. Well, I don't think it takes too much time if there's a desperate call for the police, does it? No, if you're calling a, the police or a social worker, uh, if you're being beaten up, I believe that the police are going to get there first. Hold. Hold on, please, ma'am. <coughs> what am I going to do about my cough? Can't get rid of my cough this morning. Will I take a break? I'll take a break, get rid of my cough, and come back again. Please forgive me, everybody.
Go ahead, please. Mr. Webster? Go ahead. Mr. Webster? Won't work. I was going to say to Anne to do the talking for me in case I started to cough again. I'm not Jack Webster. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Fine, Mr. Webster. I'd like to compliment you on a very uh, excellent program. I'm in municipal politics, and I'm chairman of the social services. And where I find the difficulty is, is uh, fi getting the financing for a transition house. We're not I sure. went last year to Mrs. Uh, McCarthy with a a very well organized brief and uh, she uh, heard me out as well as on, on various other social service problems in our area and um, I've had various correspondence with her and she feels that you can uh, fund a 10 bed uh, transition house on $49,000. Can you? No, you can't. If you're going to have 10 beds and you're going to have to staff the unit you're also going to have to feed the people. You're going to have to pay rent and heat. Forty-nine thousand dollars doesn't go very far. Which uh, city are we talking about, ma'am? I'm talking about Richmond. About Richmond. You don't have a transition house. No, we don't. We have an excellent crisis line. And you have lots of wife beating or husband beating. Yes. Well, no. The crisis line that that uh, that deals with all uh, crisis problems in Richmond. They have two beds which are constantly filled with various... Uh, uh, well, perhaps uh, Flora McCoy of the United Way has some thoughts on the need for more transition houses. Do you play an active part in campaigning for financing of transition houses? I, I am on the board of United Way out here. Oh, right. good. Yes, particularly... So I've, uh, I have got all the reports. Uh, okay, let's see what Flora says about it. In the divisions, uh, which in United Way terms means the North Shore, Richmond, Burnaby, North and South Fraser, the social planners have worked actively towards Transition House. The newest one is on the North Shore. It's called the Emily Murphy Transition House and opened only at Christmas. And I understand it's been heavily used since it was open. Burnaby and Richmond still have not succeeded after years of work in attracting the funds from the provincial government to establish their own municipal resource. Well, when they've got lots of money for lottery giveaways, I don't know why they can't raise some money for Transition Houses. This is where we're, we're going to go, uh, um, Mr. Webster. We're going to try the uh, lottery fund money. Ma'am, thanks for the compliments to Brian and his preparation of the program, too. Excellent. Much obliged. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, yes. Hello, Mr. Webster. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, I would like to see, I would like to uh, congratulate you for your show, and uh, I know that you have a very good show. I just listening to... Have you a question for any of my guests? I'm, 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 I'm sorry? Have you a question? Well, you see, this, uh, this uh, white beating, you know, I'm not from Canada, and uh, I could not believe the number of uh, white being bitten, you know, by the husband, you see, like... Uh, oh, we're not the worst in the world by a long shot, are we, no, Jim? In no, indeed. Um, it's a, it's a phenomenon that happens in every culture, in every society, all the way around the world. Um, and... Uh, whether we're more prevalent, I don't think so. Oh, no, we I don't think we're the worst by a long shot. No. I suggest if you go to Glasgow or Belfast or Dublin, you will find triple the amount of wife beating you find in a comparatively civilized country such as Canada. Yeah. It was in England, Jack, that the transition house movement began. Uh, Aaron Pitsy with Chiswick House was the very first. And it was when I was, idea that yeah, when I was a young there. reporter in Glasgow, it was a national sport wife beating. Mm -hmm. There isn't any doubt about that at all. But now, I don't accept what you say about it being worse here than anywhere else. Go ahead, please. Uh, hello. I wanted to know if uh, it was the Ahsoka government that actually cut back on the number of transition houses in, in the past uh, few years. Have any been closed? Yes. No, none have been closed, to my knowledge. As a matter of fact, I believe that uh, some of the present Ahsoka members have been instrumental in helping develop some of the transition houses. In, in BC. There's no doubt there's a good political pressure is needed in this field as in every other field for additional things in the way of health, welfare and transition houses. But I don't want to turn this into a political program as such. Port Alberni, go ahead please. Yes, good morning. Um, I believe the wife-beating problem is much, much deeper as it, as it looks like. I want to see the other side of the coin too. What's the other side? The man's side. You mean why he beats her? Yes. I also see that but many women uh, taken on their wives the, before they are married, their husbands, you know, and let the, the husbands believe that you can have sex anytime you want, for number one. Oh. That I am happy with a little bit. I don't <coughs> think 
in this life. Okay, let me put that in perspective. Have you ever come across a case on CAR 86, or you and your investigations? I have. Wait, just a second, my dear, till I finish the question to the panel, where the man was justified in, where a spouse was justified in beating another spouse. No. Never justified. Yeah, no, Just on. a moment, madam. I don't think that there's justification for violence in a family setting. Ever. I don't think there's much justification for violence anywhere. Mm. But I don't think it has much to do with sex either to the caller. I think it has a whole lot to do with alcohol and a whole lot to do with not being able to control yourself. Bad temper. Bad temper. For various reasons or another. Well, okay, I'd like to differ a little bit with that, Anne. Um, I, a lot of the women that I've talked to have said that sexuality certainly has been um, involved in this. The husband wants to have intercourse and she f doesn't want to and in effect you almost have uh, marital rape going on in some situations. Uh, I wasn't talking about family violence uh. in terms of rape. I was talking about family violence in terms of somebody get, not getting what they want. I guess could it be sex or whatever mm -hmm. and, and taking it out on the other person, usually the weaker person in the relationship. Right. Yeah, and we're all agreed there's no justification even if it is a sexual no. matter to beat no. the hell out of the partner. No. No. The alcohol no. issue is an important one too, Jack. Uh, it has for years been used as an excuse. In court you could say, well, I didn't remember what <coughs> happened, it was the liquor what, what did it. Uh, and increasingly that's less acceptable in court and everywhere else. People are responsible for their actions. And we've learned in talking to the women and to the men too who are uh, and have or have been batterers that they were in control that they did know what they were doing, and generally they went out to drink in order to beat. Yeah. One, uh, one interesting point is I've talked to a lot of the men who do batter, and many of them have reported that they have attempted to talk to other people about what's going on in order to get some help, and these people have included family, friends, clergy, professional helpers, police, and the response that they've met from these other people has been of denial that it could ever happen to a nice family like you, or uh, no, you know, you would never do anything like that, or else a lot of value judgments. You're a horrible, nasty person. Uh, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Yeah. So they, they get turned off or denied that it's even happened. And it's very difficult for them to find somebody even to talk about what's going on. Sam and Arm, go ahead, please. Yes, I was in law for last year. And um, I was in a situation where I was being abused by the husband who had been with me while I was on welfare, which was untrue. And um, they wanted me to come into the office. Oh, the MHR. And they What's this got to do with it? Uh, tell her to call the MHR to yeah, call uh, her social uh, worker. Uh, you're, you're not on about wife beating, are you? Is she? Yes, in a way, probably. I, am. I just can't get... Tell me the story, ma'am. What happened? Okay, I got... He was beating me all the time, and I had left him. I see. Uh, I had gone for social assistance, and I went on, and I had moved to get away from my husband, and he moved to the same town as me. And uh, he would come over, and he was visiting the kids, and slowly, slowly getting back together. And uh, he would stay maybe one night a week. And so... Well, so welfare then challenged you about your check and whatnot. Right. Yes. And they cut me off completely, and they said that he, he had been living with me, and I well, ma'am, that's an administrative problem that often arises, and perhaps we can get some broad advice from my two people here. This is something the Task Force on Family Violence looked at and made some recommendations about. The basis of the policy that we recommended was that when a woman comes to a social worker and explains what her situation is, that she be believed. Uh, and that she not be required as a very first step to go and lay a charge. The first thing she needs is a refuge and safety and a place for that weekend for herself and her children. Then there's time to discuss the, f the other matters of uh, legal aspects, uh, the application for welfare, his obligation to provide some support to her. Yeah. But what women, like this woman is describing, uh, that she faces uh, a denial from the social worker that in fact the situation she has at home is happening to her. The very important thing on which we can finish this note is that when a woman complains to whichever authority that your task force on family violence recommends that in the first instance without quibble or squabble the woman be believed. Yes, exactly. She, even without physical evidence of being beaten to a pulp. And that she be given the necessary shelter until the matter can be looked into. That physical evidence is important. Often women are beaten where it doesn't show. There are internal injuries that can happen and there's a whole range of other sorts of abuse. If there are children in the home particularly, social workers should accept that and do something on an emergency basis. 
I don't think that's common sense. I think the attitude has changed towards that a long way in the past few years. But we do need more transition houses. Indeed. Hey, we're agreed. And we don't need any more car 86s when that great day comes when people stop beating their wives or vice versa. Let's hope. My Let's thanks hope. to Constable Ann Beefdink, to Jim McKenzie, and to Flora McLeod for the Task Commission on Family Violence. We've tried this morning merely to make you a little more conscious of it. And if you are in trouble, do not hesitate to seek instant help. And I'll be back after the break. Thirty seconds here. Three Okay. Jack, this next story is about a very important matter coming before Vancouver City Council tonight. Whether or not they demolish a building that's a landmark in the West End. It's a landmark in Vancouver's West End, Inglesea Lodge. Built in 1911, it's the only apartment on the edge of the water along English Bay. It was bought by the city in 1967 and for the last couple of years has been earmarked for demolition. Half of the 45 apartments are empty. The pros and cons of the destruction of this old brick building are this. It would give the city more waterfront park space and an uninterrupted beach along English Bay. The price of demolition, $200,000. The price of putting a seawall along the block, about $20,000. Plus $170,000 for fire renovations and the city would keep the block standing and continue to collect $40,000 annual rent. At least one man, Alderman Kennedy, favors the latter move and will lead a fight to save the block at City Council tonight. Well, it's been a long-standing policy of the Parks Board to clear the entire waterfront, and they've cleared most of it, but this building has been left over for many, many years. Now, it's not an eyesore. If it were an eyesore, I perhaps would take a different view. It's, it's a building which is quite seemly to look at, and most people love it in this area. Therefore, while there's a housing shortage in the city, it's crazy, I think, to pull it down. There is a housing shortage. Just think of it, tomorrow in Council we'll be debating that housing shortage and how severe it is and thinking what on earth can we do to get houses for people and at the same time simultaneously tearing down 45 suites, potentially 45 suites to be torn down. I think it's crazy and I think that anyone who votes against that uh, point of view should have their heads examined. What do they propose to do with uh this plot of land once the building's torn down. More grass. I think some of the commissioners and the parks board might get their jollies out of more grass. But for me, it doesn't register that way. I think this is a most wonderful area. I lived across the road here myself for 11 years. And I don't see in the world why this building shouldn't remain indefinitely. Martha McLeod has lived in Anglesey for 23 years. Her father, William Boyd McKechnie, was a city alderman in 1910. The apartments like Mrs. McLeod's all have a view and each one of the old units are spacious and full of character. Mrs. McLeod pays a modest rent of $225 a month. It would be difficult, if not impossible, to replace what she has. Well, it just doesn't seem right. A building like this that is so well built, I'm sure there are several layers of brick in the <laughs> walls, and uh, there's so many good things about it, and it just seems wrong to demolish the building. They don't build them like they used to either, do they? Not at all. I've been in the, some of the newer ones and no comparison at all. Stuart Gale has lived here for a year and a half. His rent, $246 a month. He's looked and cannot find an alternate place to live for the same rent. Well, I, I, I can't buy it at all. I just can't understand the reasoning behind it. Um, this building's been here for a long time and it sort of makes part of the character of English Bay aside from providing very nice apartments for 45 uh, tenants to live in. And uh, I, just, I just fail to see the reasoning to tear down the building. Frida Carr has been here 10 years, her rent $245. She hasn't even looked and won't look for another apartment. And she doesn't think she could find one based on the current housing shortage. It's not just a question of getting rid of uh, the occupants of, say, 45 suites, but it's finding an extra 45 suites, so you're looking really at 90 suites there being taken up. You know, you're losing 45, and you're looking for another 45, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Have you even tried to look for another place? No, I haven't, yeah. I won't, I shall stay here right to the very end. Maybe in front of the records ball, I don't know, I haven't thought about that yet. One of the arguments for tearing down Anglesey Lodge is waged by some of the people in the apartments across the street. 
get rid of the old block, they say, and give us a better view of English Bay. You know, you could, you could apply that theory sort of to the people behind them. If they tore those buildings down, they'd have a nicer view, too. And uh, if you want to get back to the beginning, well, this, this building was built a long time before those ones as well. If council doesn't change its mind tonight and rescind its order for demolition of Anglesey Lodge, tenants have until March 31st to get out. If I felt better, I'd give you an opinion. I'd give you an opinion anyway, even if I don't feel good. Keep that place. Stupid <laughs> to knock it down. You want the laugh of the day? Started off the program this morning, not poking fun, pointing out the incredibly parlous state of the Canadian Armed Forces so-called. The 95, nine to five boys who would fill one side of Empire Stadium, the old Empire Stadium. Listen to this. We have decided to declare war against the Russians. That's a joke, 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 listen. Following statement was issued this morning by Carl Gerlach, the show chairman of the 1980 Pacific International Auto Show. Due to the recent Russian involvement in Afghanistan and the feelings generated by this action among the Automobile Dealers Association of Greater Vancouver, the show committee of the 1980 Pacific International Auto Show is removing the Russian Lada as a feature exhibit at the 1980 Auto Show, which opens this Friday, <laughs> January the 18th at the PNE. Show chairman Carl Gerlach. I understand that as a result of this intrepid action in removing the Russian automobile the ladder from the Pacific International Auto Show, that the Russians have immediately announced the withdrawal of all forces from Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel well, but at least I'm having a laugh. Until I look at your face. What's the matter with my face? You are, if anything, slightly uglier in real life than you are in a clipping. Well, no fault of mine. Andy's an old friend of mine. Andy <laughs> Russell is a... When did you last see a grizzly bear? Oh, last fall. How many have you shot, you brute? Not very many. How many have you... I've filmed lots of them. How many have you talked to? Oh, gosh, I've lost track. Are you Canada's leading expert on grizzly bears? No. Who I is? I share it with three, two or three other people. Two or three other people. Yeah. And what are you doing here anyway this morning? Well, I'm going into the uh, Jubilee Auditorium, I mean the uh, Queen Elizabeth Auditorium this First of all, do you know which film. town you're in? Yep, Vancouver. Which town? You're in Vancouver? Yes, sir. Which, where, are you, where are you showing your film tonight? At the uh, Queen Elizabeth Theater. What day is this? Tuesday. The date? January <laughs> 15th. 15th. <laughs> and the Sierra Club is sponsoring <laughs> yeah. your show. That's right. We haven't got time to chit-chat about the good old days. We haven't? Yeah, because, you, you know, we've done some really good stuff on the grizzly bears you've right. lived with, loved, hunted with, right? That's right. Had a lot of fun with. And you knew, as a matter of fact, you used to give names to your grizzly That's bears. That's right. We got to know about 30 by sight, so we had names for, well, a dozen of them. Uh -huh. Some of the outstanding ones, they're just as different as people, and, uh, you know, you get to like certain individuals, and some of them you don't. And you get along with all of them, you hope, because they're pretty rough animals sometimes. There are still lots of them around. Well, not lots. There never has been really lots of grizzlies, except in a very few places where the feed is uh, I thought up in the, at the Atnarco range in British Columbia that we still had unlimited <coughs> numbers of grizzly bears. Mm, not unlimited, no. Not unlimited. No, it takes a lot of range to contain a grizzly. What was this book you did recently on grizzly bears? Well, the one I did first was grizzly bear. The recent book I've done was Alpine Canada that came out this last fall. That's a sort of a general book on the um, Alpine country of Canada. Anyway, you're going to do your spill tonight at the Queen mm -hmm. Elizabeth Theatre. That's right. Grizzly bears don't beat their wives, do they? I don't think so. Once think in a while, will. maybe, what they need it. Oh, no, no, don't. <laughs> You'll spoil the whole tone of this morning's program if you come on with your old-fashioned male chauvinist nonsense, Andy Russell. Okay. Queen Elizabeth Theatre tonight. I'll be, I'll be there. The Sierra Club. It's a good cause, and you're a good guy. And the uh, film is Grizzly Country. Thank you, Jack. And I'll be back with Linda after this break. <laughs>